Hi, it's Chris Flanagan. Welcome to the Paediatric Emergencies Podcast. So today I've got another intubation talk for you. Um, this is part of the series of lectures I'm recording for our uh, Paediatric Emergencies Intubation course. Um, so today I'm dealing with the basics of direct laryngoscopy um, and this is the lecture for the course. So I hope you find it useful. Um, if you have any comments or queries, please get in contact in the comments section. So, on with the lecture. In this session, I'm going to talk about direct laryngoscopy. So what exactly do I mean by direct laryngoscopy? Well, really the clue is in the name. Uh, laryngoscopy involves looking inside the larynx, and direct means using direct vision. So you're using direct vision to look inside the larynx, normally to facilitate intubation. And this contrasts what the video laryngoscopes do uh, with video laryngoscopy. You're doing indirect laryngoscopy. So you're actually viewing the laryngeal opening on a screen and never see it directly. And with intubation then you use the video screen to help you pass the endotracheal tube. So like I said, this talk is on direct laryngoscopy. So with direct laryngoscopy you use a traditional laryngoscope um, to move the patient's tongue to the side lift their epiglottis to give yourself a view of the laryngeal opening and normally the purpose of doing this is to facilitate intubation. So to give yourself the best chance of succeeding at this it is really important that you have the patient appropriately positioned prior to starting um, and by that I mean ear to sternal notch so that the patient's um, oral axes, pharyngeal axes and tracheal axes are brought into alignment. If you think what you're doing, you're looking in through the patient's mouth and expecting to get a view of their laryngeal opening to enable you to pass an endotracheal tube. So if these axes are out of alignment, you're going to have difficulty doing it. So all the other things I'm going to tell you about are going to be absolutely useless if you haven't got the first step of positioning the patient right. So I do cover this in the intubation preparation and equipment lecture, so have a look at that for the positioning. So I'm going to break direct laryngoscopy up into a number of steps and this is really important for somebody who's new to this um, because quite often when they do their first few intubation attempts they get a bit stuck but aren't really sure why they're stuck or what they should do to fix the problem. But if you have a stepwise approach where you're completing each of the steps before moving on to the next step you'll know exactly what you're trying to do and I'm going to tell you in this talk um, how you can make that step happen and you need to complete that step before moving on to the next one. Okay so the first thing you need to do is hold the laryngoscope properly um, and regardless of whether you're right or left handed the laryngoscope is designed to be held in your left hand um, and when you look at the blade itself um, you have the light source on the right hand side and you have a flat surface on the left hand side and that flat surface is designed to be inserted up against the patient's right side of their tongue so that the tongue is pushed over to the left hand side of the mouth. Um, if you try it the other way round, it won't work. So the laryngoscope always held in your left hand and used to push the patient's tongue over towards their left hand side of their mouth so that you have space at the right hand side of the mouth to pass the endotracheal tube. So you can see in the picture here how we should hold a laryngoscope. Um, particularly for when you're intubating small patients, it's much better to hold the laryngoscope down near the blade and hold it like you would a pen, rather than traditionally holding the laryngoscope up the handle like you would in an adult. And the reason for that is, and you can see from the picture there, you've got much more control over the tip of that laryngoscope fine movements of your fingers will move the tip um, and that's really important whenever you're dealing with really small anatomy in neonates where you're trying to lift an epiglottis out of the way you'll have much more control of it um, and in those small patients you don't need a lot of force to lift the tissues out of the way so you won't lose anything by holding the laryngoscope down near the blade um, in the older patients you do actually need quite a bit of lifting force um, with the tip of the blade and the vallecula 
to expose the laryngeal opening. And if you do try to hold it down near the tip, you might struggle to lift it. There's no harm in starting in that position and then moving your hand up the handle um, to give you the extra force you need to lift the tissues out of the way. Okay, so you're holding the ringoscope in your left hand. The next thing you need to do is open the patient's mouth with your right hand um, to make room to insert the ringoscope. Um, generally, the best way of doing this is to scissor open the mouth. And you can see from the picture here on the left hand side, um, the mouth is being scissored open using your thumb on the uh, lower incisors and your index finger on the upper incisors. And if you just make a, a scissoring motion with your hand, it'll open the mouth. Um, and this is really important that you open the patient's mouth widely and make plenty of room to get the laryngoscope in. Um, this is often one of the steps that people new to laryngoscopy struggle with. They'll try a few different manoeuvres, the mouth isn't open very much and they struggle to make room to get the laryngoscope in and waste maybe five, six seconds inserting the laryngoscope. The problem is those five or six seconds that you've wasted in getting the laryngoscope in um, limits the five or six seconds at the end of the intubation where you've got to get the endotracheal tube in before the patient desaturates. So these initial steps are just as important as the ones later on. Um, in neonates, um, generally what I would do is just put a finger in on top of the tongue, um, which means that you've got the mouth open and you've got space to get the laryngoscope in. Um, quite often in these babies, the, the top of the tongue becomes stuck to the top of the mouth. And when the laryngoscope is put in, it's actually in underneath the tongue and there's no space that you're going to get down in uh, the back of the throat. So simple things, now to open the mouth, get the laryngoscope in quickly so you're not wasting any time. Okay, so now you've got the mouth open, the next step is to insert the laryngoscope. Um, and the laryngoscope, as we've mentioned already, should be inserted down the patient's right hand side of the mouth so that the tongue can be pushed over towards the left hand side of the mouth. Um, so when you're inserting the laryngoscope, it's really important to take care that you're not catching the patient's lips or teeth um, during the insertion. Um, with a straight braid, normally you can insert it directly down the right hand side of the mouth. Um, sometimes, particularly in older patients or if you're using a long handle, um, there can be difficulty getting the laryngoscope into the mouth um, because the patient's chest uh, catches on the handle itself. Um, so you can overcome this by rotating the laryngoscope into the mouth. So it's held horizontal um, in your left hand and you kind of rotate it in a 90 degree angle as it comes in to the mouth. And you can see this in the picture here, held to the side and then rotated into the mouth. And that just prevents the end of the handle getting stuck on the patient's chest. Okay, so we've got the laryngoscope into the mouth and um, the next thing is tongue control. So what you want to do is move the laryngoscope down the patient's right hand side of the mouth pushing the tongue over to the left hand side of the mouth. Um, and a common mistake that people new to laryngoscopy do, they're in such a hurry to um, get on and get the intubation done, is that they'll either go over the top of the tongue or even sometimes end up down the left hand side of the tongue. Um, and this will cause problems. I've not been pedantic about there's a particular way that the laryngoscope is being designed to use and it must be used that way. Um, you can see in the picture on the screen here, um, you've got the laryngoscope positioned. Um, it's a straight blade and it's left at the epiglottis. And you can see over the left hand side of the screen, you've got the tongue pushed all the way over to the left. And you've actually got no tongue at all um, on top of the laryngoscope or over its right hand side. And you could imagine if you were going to pass the endotracheal tube there, you have a lovely straight view to the laryngeal opening. Now, if you imagine you had some of the tongue caught on top of that laryngoscope blade, the problem is that alters your angle um, for laryngoscopy and also for passing the endotracheal tube. It's going to make the laryngeal opening appear even more anterior because the tongue is going to move your laryngoscope down and it's going to give you a more awkward view 
of the, the laryngeal opening and you might even not have a full view of it like you do there and um, so that's going to make it more difficult for you to intubate that patient so all these steps matter it's really important that you take your time move the tongue over to the left hand side making sure that you haven't gone over the top of the tongue and that you've caught all the tongue and pushed it over okay so you've got the laryngoscope into the mouth you've got control of the tongue the next thing to do is to try and locate the epiglottis so you should advance the laryngoscope down the pharynx searching for the epiglottis so the epiglottis is one of the key landmarks it's going to help you identify where you are in the airway um, and we've covered airway anatomy in a previous lecture so if you know your airway anatomy you know where the epiglottis is you know where the laryngeal opening is going to be um, and you can focus all your attention then on where you expect the laryngeal opening to be while you do some of the further maneuvers that we're going to talk about to expose it so really really important move your laryngoscope down the pharynx searching for the epiglottis so what do you do once you find the epiglottis well the next step is to expose the laryngeal opening um, and you do this by lifting the epiglottis out of the way um, and how you do this um, depends on what type of blade you have selected if you're using a curved blade you should direct the tip into the vallecula behind the epiglottis where it will lift the epiglottis indirectly by applying pressure on the glossoepiglottic ligament if you're using a straight blade you should manipulate the tip in underneath the epiglottis and then directly lift the epiglottis up and out of the way um, regardless of which method you're using um, when it comes to either lifting the epiglottis or um, applying pressure in the vallecula um, it's important that the angle that you apply pressure is away from yourself and that you should not be levering the laryngoscope back um, to move its tip anterior the problem with moving the laryngoscope back is that the top of the laryngoscope uh, the blade then applies pressure on the patient's teeth gums or lips and can cause damage um, it's also an ineffective way of lifting because it limits the space that you have in the mouth as well whereas if you actually pull the laryngoscope away from yourself you increase the space that you have to pass the endotracheal tube so not only does it um, mean that you're not injuring the patient with the laryngoscope but it actually makes it easier for yourself so you can see the angle here that you should be lifting the laryngoscope away from yourself it's almost 45 degrees um, and what I tell people to do is look at the far wall um, where it meets the ceiling and pull the laryngoscope handle in that direction and make sure you don't rock it back. So I just want to cover a little bit of troubleshooting on using a straight blade. So sometimes you're trying to use a straight blade to lift the epiglottis directly and no matter what you do, you just can't get the epiglottis lifted well you have a couple of options um, should you find yourself in that situation the first thing you can do is just insert the laryngoscope too deep so that you've got a view of the esophagus and then what you can slowly do is slowly back the laryngoscope out of the mouth and you'll reach a point where suddenly the laryngeal opening falls into view up anteriorly um, but at that point you still will have the epiglottis lifted behind the laryngoscope so it's important that you stop withdrawing the laryngoscope when the laryngeal opening appears because if you withdraw a little bit further then the epiglottis will fall down again and you'll be back at that point again um, some people would actually say for novices learning laryngoscopy with a straight blade that should be the preferred technique you always insert the laryngoscope too deep and withdraw it out um, I would recommend that you try and use the laryngoscope um, the way I've mentioned, working your way down, trying to find the epiglottis and lift it directly because in the long run um, that's a much more useful way to be able to do it and when you switch from a straight blade to a curved blade it'll appear more natural 
because you're working your way down the pharynx, searching for the epiglottis and putting it into the vlecula this time. Whereas if you always insert it too deep, um, you won't be prepared for that. But certainly if you're struggling to lift it, that's a very good option. The other option you have is you use the straight blade like you would a curved blade. And by that I mean you put the tip of the straight blade into the vallecula and apply pressure on the glossoepiglottic ligament and try and lift the epiglottis indirectly. Um, in general, um, you probably will get a slightly worse view than you would if you've lifted the epiglottis directly. Um, and that's because the, the reason you're generally using a straight blade, um, it's younger patients who have a large floppy epiglottis and a lax glossoepiglottic ligament. Um, so the pressure on that ligament only partially lifts the epiglottis out of the way. However, if you've been struggling and you've got um, no other way, having a partial view of the laryngeal opening is better than none at all. So you can put the tip into the molecular and if you combine it with a little bimanual laryngoscopy, so that's where the intubator puts a little bit of pressure over the laryngeal opening externally, you generally get a view that enables you to intubate the patient. So like I said, I would recommend trying to lift the tip of the epidolis directly using a straight blade. But if you can't do that, your, your two options, one, go too deep and withdraw back slowly. And in doing so, you will directly lift the epiglottis. That's probably the preferred option. Um, and your second option then is just to put the tip of the straight blade into the vallecula and combine it with some external laryngeal manipulation to improve your view. Okay, so the next thing you need to do is once you have exposed the laryngeal opening is to try and optimise the view. So obviously if you have a grade 1 view where you can see everything that you should be able to see, you can skip this step. But if you have a grade 2 view or worse, you should try and improve things using external laryngeal manipulation. As I already mentioned, external laryngeal manipulation is external pressure over the larynx, which is designed to improve the view the intubator has. And it's normally posterior pressure that you're applying, um, but it can be either right or left, moving the larynx into the right position that optimizes the view. Um, and ideally, this should be bimanual laryngoscopy, where the intubator actually uses their right hand to apply pressure to the larynx externally, so that they move it to the position that um, gives the best view and what they should then do at that stage is get their assistant to hold the larynx externally in that position again freeing up their right hand to pass the endotracheal tube. Um, what you'll often see is people will blindly ask for external pressure and the problem is the the person assisting you can't see what is the right view and then somebody will say push it right push it left it's much quicker and more effective if you do that yourself. Like I say, by, by manual technique, left hand holding the ringoscope, right hand applying the pressure. So you can very quickly try a few things, find the right position, and then get your airway assistant to hold the larynx in that position for you. If you're intubating um, neonates or small infants, what you can do is actually use your little finger um, to apply the pressure. So it's your little finger on your left hand so you you hold the ringoscope with your other fingers um, but you can take your little finger away and apply the pressure that you need over the larynx externally um, and this just means you're skipping out that step of somebody else having to assist you again this is obviously harder to do in bigger patients um, firstly there's a bigger distance that your finger needs to travel and also you need much more pressure and it can be quite difficult to do with a little finger. So this technique is really just for neonates and small infants. So another really important point that I want to do, so say you've you've done your external laryngeal manipulation, you've improved your view, one of the other things you need to do is make as much room as you have as possible to pass the endotracheal tube. And important doing this is making sure you've got the laryngoscope moved all the way over to the left hand side of the mouth. So quite often what I see um, people new to laryngoscopy doing is 
yes, they may have moved the, put the laryngoscope down the right hand side of the tongue, but they haven't actually pushed that over to the left very well. So the laryngoscope is actually still over the right hand side of the mouth and they have a very tiny corner in that right hand side of the mouth that they're working down and they're going to pass their endotracheal tube down that little tiny corner. What you should do is actually give the tongue a really, really good shove over. If you haven't done it at the start, as you've, you're optimizing your view, make sure that you've got that laryngoscope almost over touching the left hand side of the mouth. And that just gives you a really big passage where you can pass the endotracheal tube. Much more important if you're doing a nasal tube, because you've put in forceps and different things into the mouth or you're exchanging a, an oral for a nasal tube. But equally as important with a, an oral tube because it will improve the angle that you've got to pass that tube. And you can see in the picture here, um, the image over the um, left hand side shows the laryngoscope positions midway across the mouth. And like I say, some people won't even have it that far over and they're working in a little tiny corner over the right hand side. And if you compare that to the image over the right hand side of the slide, um, where the laryngoscope has been pulled all the way over to the left hand side, you can just see how much more space you've got to work in that mouth. Okay, so now you've got the view optimized as best you can. The next step is inserting the endotracheal tube. Um, and the endotracheal tube should be inserted from the right hand side of the patient's mouth rather than inserting it straight down from the midline. Um, and the reason for that is if you insert it straight from a midline position, your view of the laryngeal opening as you pass the tube is going to be blocked. So if you work it in from the right hand corner of the mouth, um, you should be able to see it directly passing through the laryngeal opening and your view of that shouldn't be obscured. So really important point here, um, you need to see the tube going in and you don't want to make it more difficult for yourself. So get used to passing it from the right hand corner of the mouth. Um, if you want to make that even easier, what you can do is get your assistant to apply a little bit of pressure over the right hand corner of the mouth. And again, that just makes you a little bit more space and improves your angle for passing that endotracheal tube. Okay, so I just want to cover a little bit of troubleshooting um, when it comes to passing the endotracheal tube. Um, so it's not uncommon that actually you can see that you've passed the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords, but then you come up against some obstruction um, and it won't pass further down into the trachea. So this generally happens because the tip of the endotracheal tube has become stuck on the anterior tracheal rings. Um, and this occurs because the, the angle of the trachea as it goes away from the mouth down into the chest, it runs from an anterior to slightly posterior tract. So that when you pass the endotracheal tube through the laryngeal opening, um, it can come stuck on the anterior wall. Um, and this is more of a problem in older children because the tracheal rings are better developed and more likely to obstruct the endotracheal tube. Um, passing down into the trachea and it's quite rare that this actually happens in neonates. So what do you do when this happens? Well you can see from the picture here the, the endotracheal tube has a bevel on it and this bevel is designed to help you with exactly this problem. Um, so what you should do obviously at the moment the tube is stuck on the ring so you should withdraw it slightly. Um, Depending on the age of the child, maybe half a centimetre is all you need, just to take it off that ring. And then you need to advance it again. Um, if you advance it just the way it is, it'll get stuck in exactly the same place. But what you need to do when you advance it, you need to be rotating the tube as you advance. And then that little bevel at the end of the tube will just roll off the tracheal ring and let you pass the tube on down into the trachea. So that's what you should do with an oral tube, should this happen. Um, it's actually more common that this happens with a nasal tube. Um, and the reasons for that, as you can see from this picture, this is an endotracheal tube that has been passed down the patient's nose. Um, so it tends to sit 
very posteriorly on the posterior pharyngeal wall. And then what you need to do with this tube is lift it up with your forceps, pass it through the laryngeal opening. But as we've mentioned, as you, as you see the laryngeal opening there, it then angles down the way posteriorly. So you've got a tube that starts posteriorly, needs to come anteriorly, and then needs to go posteriorly again. So it's not surprising that a nasal tube is more likely to catch on the anterior tracheal rings. And the problem with this is if you try to rotate the tube um, in the nose, um, because it's, it's traveling um, so much in the nasal passages, the rotation that you cause externally, very little of it is actually applied at the end of the tip. So a much better technique with a nasal tube is to use the forceps and with a turning motion on the forceps, angle the tube down the way into the trachea. Obviously, again, you have to pull it back slightly um, so it's, it's free from that obstruction on the ring. Then turn it down and try a slightly different angle in the trachea, trying to get it off that tracheal ring. So I do want to talk a little bit um, about nasal endotracheal intubation. So nasal endotracheal intubation is generally regarded as more comfortable for the child and is more secure. Um, there's less risk of unplanned extubation. However, um, nasal endotracheal intubation is technically more difficult than oral intubation. Um, and even in experienced hands, it has a slightly higher failure risk compared to oral intubation, and it generally takes slightly longer as well. There's also certain um, critically ill patients nasal intubation is going to be contraindicated in. So anybody who's at risk of a basal skull fracture, so any um, patient with head trauma, um, or anybody who's at risk of bleeding, so coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia. So any septic patient at presentation is at risk of both these. So a nasal tube is going to be contraindicated until you know what their clotting and platelets are. So with this in mind, um, the critically ill child should be intubated orally initially. As we've said, it's the fastest way to secure the airway and it's the way that is most likely to succeed. So the endotracheal tube can then be converted over to a nasal tube um, provided the child is stable. Doing so isn't contraindicated and the benefits of doing so outweigh any risks. Um, this can be either immediately, um, if everything is good, or it can be a few days down the line if prolonged intubation is going to be needed. Um, and at that stage, um, the child is more stable than they were initially. Um, what I do want to say here is the practice of converting a perfectly good functioning oral endotracheal tube to a nasal tube just because of local preference in unstable patients. For example, a septic patient or a patient who's post arrest is both unnecessary and dangerous and really must be discouraged. So it must be remembered the best endotracheal tube is the one that's in the trachea. So please, please, please don't change oral to nasal tubes in unstable patients. Okay, so I want to go on and talk a little bit about nasal intubation. Um, you can do a direct nasal intubation in a stable patient. Um, this talk is about intubating a critically unwell child. So I'm not going to talk about direct nasal intubation. I'm going to talk about how you convert an oral endotracheal tube to a nasal endotracheal tube. So the first thing you need to do when converting an oral to a nasal tube is to get the endotracheal tube from the right hand side of the mouth um, over to the left hand side of the mouth. And that just keeps it out of your way when you're doing the later steps. Um, and when you intubate a child orally because you are working down the right hand side of the mouth, the, the tube ends up at the right hand side of the mouth. So almost certainly it ends up secured at the right hand side of the mouth. So you just need to loosen any tapes that are on it and move it over the top of the tongue over to the left hand side of the mouth. And then it's important that you have an assistant hold the tube there. And importantly, continue to ventilate the child via that oral endotracheal tube 
throughout the procedure. Now it is important that how they hold that tube um, and it will make your life much easier if they hold it from the side so that none of their hand is over the part of the mouth where you're going to be working them. So they should hold the tube between a finger and thumb over at the side and out of your way. Likewise, it's important that any bagging circuit that they're using to continue to ventilate that child is off the patient's chest so that everything is way over the left hand side out of your way and you have a lovely clear view um, of the patient's mouth onto their chest and there's nothing obstructing you. So the next thing you need to do is pass a second lubricated endotracheal tube down the patient's nostril. And you generally should stop um, once you feel it give and the tube enters the pharynx. Um, and how far you need to pass the tube generally comes with experience. Although if you pass it not far enough or too far, that's not a big problem with this switching over method. Um, if you have any difficulty passing the tube um, down the nose, try the other nostril. Make sure you've got enough um, lubrication on the tube. Um, Alternatively, what you can do is actually pass a, a suction catheter, as you can see in this picture, down the endotracheal tube. Then um, pass the suction catheter down the patient's nostril and then pass the endotracheal tube over the top of the suction catheter and then remove the suction catheter. In doing this, um, it means that any pressure that you're using on the endotracheal tube, you know it's um, in the right direction and the tube is much more likely to pass um, over the top of that suction catheter. And it also you know there's a patent passage down there. Um, so once you've got the endotracheal tube down the patient's nostril, you need to insert the ringoscope and get a view of the laryngeal opening um, using the steps that we've previously described. One of the big advantages of um, having the oral tube in is that you can just follow the oral tube to the laryngeal opening. So the next thing you need to do is to give the airway a good suctioning. So you want to suction up around the laryngeal opening and also down onto the posterior pharyngeal wall because your nasal tube quite often sits down in that posterior pharyngeal wall in a pool of secretions. And the reason I'm recommending you suction, even if your view is not obstructed, is you've got all the time that you want here. The patient is being ventilated by that oral tube. You want to optimize your view as best as possible. And while the secretions may be sitting in that posture, your laryngeal wall aren't obstructing your view, you can see everything you need to see. Once you put out that oral tube, the last thing you want to do is those secretions to start causing you problems at that stage. So much better get rid of them at the start uh, while you've got all the time that you want um, but while the patient's currently been ventilated via that oral endotracheal tube. So with the secretion suction, you can normally see your um, nasal tube lying on the posterior uh, pharyngeal wall. Um, and what you want to do is ensure that you've got it at the correct length at the nose. Um, so you can tell us at the correct length because its tip is positioned midway between the end of the soft palate and the lateral jail opening. Um, if it's too long or too short, all you need to do is adjust the length of the nose. So while you're looking, either advance or retract the tube till its tip lies just at that midpoint between the end of the soft palate and the laryngeal opening. If after um, adjusting the tip, you still can't see your tube, um, quite often that's because it's sitting in behind the oral endotracheal tube over at the, the left hand side of the pharynx. Um, there's a couple of ways you can move it over to the right. One is you either withdraw it um, in the nostril slightly and as you're reinserting it, turn the, turn the end of the tube clockwise and that tends to move its tip over towards the right. Or you can use your forceps to push the oral tube over towards the left hand side and then quite often you can then grab hold of the tube with the forceps. Um, it's much more common that the tube obviously is passed down the left nostril. It tends to sit over the left hand side of the pharynx where the view of it can be blocked by the oral tube.
So like I said, the next step then is to grab hold of the tube um, with the forceps. And then what you need to do is bring that tube up towards the um, laryngeal opening so that you could pass it if the oral tube wasn't blocking the way. So how do you know you can pass it? Um, and how do you know you're going to have a good view when the oral tube is removed? Because you can't see the vocal cords um, because the oral tube is going to be blocking them. So what you need to do, you can see on the, the screen here, I've highlighted the posterior cartilages in below the oral endotracheal tube. So it's really, really important that you can see these posterior cartilages. If you can see these with the oral tube above it, you know that once that oral tube is removed, you just need to pass your nasal tube above these cartilages and it'll go into the airway. Um, if you can't see these cartilages um, below the tube, um, whenever that oral tube is pulled out, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a good view. The um, airway can actually be much more anterior and that's why you're not able to see them. So if this is the case, you should not pull out that oral tube until you're happy with the view. You should try some of the other steps we've mentioned about optimising the view. And if it can't be optimised, you should abandon the procedure rather than pulling out a perfectly good oral tube just to swap it to a nasal tube. So once you're happy, you've got that view, you can see the posterior cartilages, everything looks straightforward. You've got hold of your tube and your forceps, it's right up at the laryngeal opening. Um, at that very moment, you just ask your assistant to put out the oral tube. And then it's generally a two second switch where you pass the nasal tube into the hole that's just appeared. If there is any difficulty passing the tube, as we've already mentioned, um, because of the angle that the nasal tube comes in and the slightly um, anterior to posterior uh, direction the trachea travels in, um, the tube can become caught over the rings on the anterior part of the trachea. Um, so your options are to try and angle down with the forceps, a bit of a twisting motion on the tube. Um, the other thing that I often find works well is just leave the tube sitting um, at the laryngeal opening and then advance it from the nose. So either that turning down motion with the forceps to get it in or to just leave it sitting at the laryngeal opening and push at the nose um, tends to work to help get that endotracheal tube in. Um, important that you have a, a quick check um, after you pass the tube to make sure the depth markers are appropriately positioned um, before removing the laryngoscope. Okay, so that was a very quick run through direct laryngoscopy. Um, it's really important with direct laryngoscopy that you make it systematic and boring. Do things the same way every time, working through each of those steps in turn, completing each of them before moving on to the next one. So that if you struggle with one of the steps, you'll know exactly where the problem is and you're not going to have that problem where you don't succeed, but you're not sure why.